right, hello and welcome to the Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Says Pop Online, Says Magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am delighted to be joined by Chester Elton, who is over in New Jersey. How are you doing, Chester? Doing great, John. Thanks for the invite. Absolutely. And I, as usual, I'm here in lovely San Diego. So Chelton, uh, Chester has uh, spent two decades helping clients engage with employees and execute on strategy, vision, and values. Uh, he is inspiring, entertaining. He is number one best-selling um, leadership author. And what I love is Chester has been called by, the, by Canada's Globe and Mail, the apostle of appreciation. That's a <laughs> That's quite an accolade. <laughs> yeah, we lo I love that title. It's, uh, it says it all, doesn't it? It does. And so what we wanted to talk today about is the concept of all-in culture, engaging your people, enabling your teams, and energizing your leaders. So what do you mean, Chester, by all-in culture? So we define an all-in culture, a place where people believe what they do matters, they make a difference. And then I like to add, and when they make a difference, somebody notices and celebrates it. They say thank you. Mm -hmm. So, so that's a good that's a good point. It's a good starting point because we you know, well, obviously we're very good at noticing and identifying when people do things not so good, right? Right. We're not, we're not as good. At, we're not we're not wired for some reason um, to catch people doing good things or doing things right. And to uh, so, what what is it about that? That's a kind of a strange thing where we almost have to teach ourselves to do that. Yes. Well, you know, I think by nature, we're defensive. We look for danger. And so we tend to be quicker to criticize than we are to recognize. Mm -hmm. I find it in particular with new leaders, uh, particularly new sales leaders, actually. Mm -hmm. the, uh, you've got the promotion. There's this idea that you've got to prove yourself. And the way you prove yourself is you're always right. You're never wrong. Uh, and so if you're always right, then kind of everybody else is always wrong, right? So mm -hmm. you're you're much more critical than you are, um, you know, compassionate. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a very good point, particularly picking up on the sales leader aspect. Because let's face it, it's it's, it's most sales leaders are are promoted from being top salespeople. That's just traditionally how it's done. And as we know. You know, top performers don't always make the best managers or leaders, but the the bigger thing is we never train them, right? We rarely train them. We say, "Ah, oh, Chester, you're the you're 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 top sales guy. You take over the sales team and just get them to do what you do, and life will be good." Right, right. And you know, it's really interesting. You take a look at. I know sports analogies are are way overused. Uh, I think the reason for that is they kind of work. They do. <laughs> you know? is that you look at some of the great coaches, some of the great leaders in whatever sport you choose, it's very rare that they were the superstar player, mm -hmm. you know, which kind of makes sense because if you're sort of an average to midland player, you, to, 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 to get there, you've got to really study the, the technique, the systems, and so on. Plus, you know, we talk a lot about what are your key motivators. You know, a lot of times um, the key motivators of a great salesperson are not the same key motivators as a great sales leader. You know, one of the things we found fascinating, uh, John, is actually we've got this online assessment called the Motivators Assessment. We've had over 60,000 people take it, a, a big chunk of those as salespeople. And it, it's fascinating to me that, that of the 23 motivators we identified at work, for some of the best salespeople we've ever, you know, surveyed, money is at the very bottom. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Do, do you find that surprising? Yeah, in some ways, yeah. But, but what do you find? What what comes out as number one then? Is service oriented, right? Uh, high in empathy, high in, uh, in 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 really that idea of making a difference, impact. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's it's interesting. And as we took a deeper dive on that, particularly for salespeople, they said, you know, money was a satisfier. It was a part of their scorecard. Sure. It wasn't necessarily a motivator. What they were really motivated by was that service culture, that empathy, and making a difference for their customers. Once they did that, the money flowed. Yeah, and I think that's the important point is that, that they, the money will flow if you do if you do those other things. And and that's why I always think if you're going to if you're going to sell something, you should really sell something that you believe in, that you could believe makes a difference. And um, because then it becomes so much easier. Like if I'm selling something to you, Chester, and I really believe that if you buy this, it's going to make an impact in your life. That's very different from me just trying to get a commission check, right? Exactly. You know, I'll tell you a cute experience. I sold books door to door to pay my way through college. 
and it was the Knaves Topical Bible, right? And the Knaves mm -hmm. Study Bible. So it was the King James Version, right? So we'd go to these great little Midwest communities and so on. And, and I, I was at a, a sales meeting we'd have at the end of every week. And one guy comes up to me, he says, do you think it's important that you believe in your, in your product? And I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, you know, I've never, ever read anything in the Bible. I said, yeah, that actually is a problem. <laughs> you really should at least have opened the book before you try to sell it to somebody. So I couldn't agree with you more. And I think it's that when you marry your passion with your skill set, that's where you have high engagement, you have high productivity. Mm -hmm. If you really do believe, I, you know, the best salespeople I've ever talked to uh, or ever had experience with is, to your point, they believed it would make a difference. They never sold anybody anything they didn't think they needed mm -hmm. or that would help them improve. Uh, and, and I think if that's your philosophy in sales, you'll go a long way. Now, talking about sales leadership, you know, this whole idea of uh, the difference between the good leaders and the extraordinary leaders in our work has always been the soft skills, mm -hmm. right? The hard skills had to be there. You had to know the industry, products, and so on. It was their soft skills, their ability to relate to the team, to be able to treat everyone fairly and yet differently, mm -hmm. right? Whether it be a generational difference or a, a cultural difference or, or whatever the barriers might be. And so that idea of, well, when you think about the best leaders you've ever worked for, I guarantee you they cared about you. And because they cared about you, you cared about them. Well, those are soft skills. And number one in those soft skills was that they, um, were grateful. They expressed recognition and gratitude. They remembered to say thank you in very simple ways, whether it was giving of their time, little handwritten notes, uh, making sure that you had that work-life harmony that was, in, if that is important to, you, to be with your family. So really some interesting insights that I think translate very, very well uh, to the world of leadership and certainly to the, to the world of sales. Because I think exactly uh, to your point, I think the toughest part is, uh, you know, when somebody becomes a sales leader, if they were a top performer or whatever, is that idea of where they just want, why can't you just all just do what I did, just do what I did. And in rather than sort of go, well, Chester operates a little differently. He need he has different motivators. He needs to be handled in a different way. And I think that's tough for for all sorts to leaders in in all in all uh, disciplines is this idea of of that there is no one way to communicate with everybody. Exactly, and there's no one way to sell. You mm -hmm. know, people say, "Oh, he's a born salesman." Yeah. Well, you know, from your experience, I mean, you've got introverts that are extraordinary salespeople. You've got yeah. extroverts that are extraordinary salespeople. You've got people that are very technical that are excellent salespeople. You know, um, I always love the uh, the adage when we were we were selling books door to door. I said, people say, "Oh, I hate salespeople." I say, "No, you don't. You love salespeople if they're selling what you want." Yeah. You know, or guys would say, "I hate selling," and he'd say, "No, you don't. You hate not selling." Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> that's selling, everybody loves being a salesman. <laughs> what you hate is not selling. You know, <laughs> so uh, marrying that, you know, that passion with the right product with the right motivators, I think is a challenge. And you know, particularly in sales. Um, there really is a, a profile that you're looking for, not necessarily in, in, in character and makeup, you're looking in those key motivators. Are they service oriented? Do they, do they care? Are they integral uh, more than anything? And uh, once you marry that up, I'll tell you, you know, I love when we have these conversations, particularly about leaders, about giving some tips that we've seen great leaders yeah. do. And I'm, I'm a big fan of random acts of kindness. You know, I think great leaders, to your point, they, they see the things that are going wrong that need to be corrected, certainly. They also see all the little things that are going right. Yeah. So we, we found this great leader in Dallas, Texas, Carlos Aguilera. And to remind himself that there were a lot of good things happening every day, he put uh, 10 coins in his left pocket. And he set a goal to have 10 positive interactions with his people every day. And I love that. It, we, we were talking to him and he said, look, it's lunchtime. I've got, you know, eight pennies in my left pocket. I've, I, I'm not doing my job. And when you think about that, he's got to be with his people. He's got to be very aware. He's got to be see, seeing what's going on. He's kind of walking in their shoes. And so when he shows up, you know, at whatever that kiosk is at the mm -hmm. airport or location at a hotel, his people are happy to see him. Right. right? And, and then when he has to have the tough conversation, they're open to his coaching because he's built up this reservoir of goodwill. So, you know, for the listeners, I challenge you, it's, it, 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 10 
every day, by the way, is a lot, right? And it's, you know, it's maybe dropping a note or spending some time or the verbal praise or the team huddle or calling a particular behavior out that it was exceptional. And yeah. uh, Harvard actually did a study that a positive workplace, the ratio of positive to negative is at least five to one. So I and think that's a great question. What is your ratio? Yeah, I love that. And, and, I, and I love the other part of it, too, is because you said because he does this, he's able to have the difficult conversations because there's a kind of a there's a bit of a, a, a cultural thing out there right now where we've gone. The pendulum has gone to one side to the other where it's all about, you know, my job as a leader is to make you feel great all the time. Right. To be happy, right. to love what you're doing. And and. That's not really my job. My job is, yes, my job is to find what motivates. My job is to make sure you ha you're equipped to succeed. And as you just said a few moments ago, the, you know, giving you positive feedback. But my job is also to give you tough feedback sometimes or to, you know, course correct or whatever. So it's, a, it, it's that balance. And I think sometimes we've lost that. I couldn't agree more. You know, you need to take a personal responsibility for your own engagement to a great degree. The leader's job is to really give you the tools. You know, we talk about enablement. You know, I've got to give you the training and the tools to be able to do the job I'm asking. I think another great role of the leader has always been is paint the vision. What is the noble cause? Mm -hmm. You know, particularly in the, in, the, in the generation that's coming up, the millennial generation, which is already the biggest in the workforce, impact and learning are high motivators for them. Mm -hmm. so the picture about how our, you know, what we do and how we do is, is key. Why we do it, how it's making a difference to our clients, to our, our company, to the, to the environment, to the economy, to the world in general. I mean, you can paint that big picture. And when people are energized around that, what we call noble cause, really good things happen, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I love the leaders that can constantly bring that into the conversation. Look, we're doing this because, and here's why we do it. And here's going to be the impact. And we may be going through a tough time now. Let's, let's keep the big vision at the end, how our products and services are changing the world. That mm -hmm. is the role of the leader. Then, you know, as, as that, whether I'm a salesperson or in sales support or whatever it might be, to make sure that I can connect the dots, that what I do every day uh, helps contribute to that vision. If the leader can put those things in place, and put you in a place where you're motivated to do what you are. In other words, you're, you're not just technically proficient, you're passionate, mm -hmm. good things happen. Now, on the other side, if you've got a mismatch, that's on the leader to correct it. Yeah. If you've got somebody on your team that's not pulling their weight, initially the team will blame the person, and then very quickly that translates uh, to the leader because you can fix it and you chose not to. Yeah. So leaders have a lot of pressure, a lot of responsibility, I do love that you brought to the floor, though, that as employees, we have just as much pressure to make sure that we're taking personal responsibility and we don't say, well, it's all on my leader. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, I love that last point about that. That's a really critical point is, yes, when somebody's not pulling their weight, the other team members will initially be ticked off at that person. But if it, if it goes on over a period of time and they know you know about it, the, the frustration switches. Absolutely. That transference is, is very rapid, by the yeah. way. It's, by the old, it's by, why the old adage, you know, hire slow, fire fast, actually mm -hmm. has meaning, right? Yeah, but, and actually, I mean, it's uh, something, what is it, I think it was Peter Drucker once wrote, he said that the biggest, the biggest mistake in executives make, in his estimation, is that they don't uh, get rid of um, bad hires fast enough. Exactly. Because that, you know, because you obviously get into that thing where going, oh my goodness, I hired this person. I don't want to look like I made a mistake. Well, I, I'm, I have, hold my hands up and I say hiring is one of the toughest things you can do. And I guarantee I've made more bad hires than good hires in my career. Yeah. By the way, <laughs> agreeing with Peter Drucker is a pretty safe thing to do as well. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Um, so what are some other things that you can do today to build a... So here's an, interesting, uh, here's an interesting challenge that a lot of organizations are facing now. I'm going to face more and more in the future. Um, is distributed organizations, right? So people are working remotely a lot more. It's great because it allows you to find the best talent wherever they choose to live. It gives people a chance to choose where they want to live as opposed to have to locate themselves physically besides... But it means then when you have an organization that maybe isn't in a building or whatever, you have to build that culture over digital means like this. That's quite a challenge for leaders now. 
It is. You know, an organization that does this particularly well, well, two actually, is the USPTO in DC. It's the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Um, I think at this point, over a third of their employees telecommute. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is if you've ever been stuck in traffic in DC, you know exactly why. Yeah. I, lived, I, lived in, I lived in DC. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's you know. It just it becomes suicidal, you know. It's well, just... you you really look forward to any federal holidays because right. you know because most <laughs> of the federal holidays, like you know, regular businesses don't have. So you would just go, you would be commuting into work and think, wow, the roads are empty. Ah, got to be a federal holiday. Right. <laughs> and then you say to yourself, this is about how many people really should live in this neighborhood. You yeah, know? exactly. Um, so what they do is, is this constant contact kind of thing. They do require them to come in a certain number of days, whether it's a month or a quarter, which I think is important. You know, human contact, as much as we talk about being remote and so on, we are social animals. We like to breathe the same air, and there's value to that. Uh, secondly, you know, is a schedule regular contact. You know, I love Zoom. I love Skype. Uh, it's it's a lot uh, it's a lot harder for me to multitask while I'm talking to you while I'm on camera. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can sneak in a text here and there. <laughs> uh, it is more difficult. Um, phone calls. I, I'm a big fan of even uh, handwritten notes and, and and letters. It's a different conversation. Not very many people do it anymore. It's 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 always welcome. Um, and the group texts and the and the, you know whether you have the the um, you know, emails are becoming a little less um, effective. I think that the best leaders really do sit down with their people and say, look, what is the best way for me to stay in touch with you? Mm -hmm. uh, texting gets, uh, gets responded to much faster than emails, of course. Uh, Zoom conversations, I think, are wonderful. When can we meet face-to-face? Uh, -face? And you, you put that regular cadence because what you don't want to have happen is these remote employees feel like they're forgotten. Yeah. or they're marginalized, or they're not as valuable. And so as you set up all these little touches, um, I kind of call it contact theory. The more contact you have, the more likely you are to, to build a relationship, and the less likely you are to feel marginalized or, or forgotten. So good leaders will take the time, and it will vary by person. You yeah. know, uh, some people will say, look, I, I only Zoom. You know, if, if you want me to respond, set up a Zoom call. Or I only respond to text. If you're going to send me an email, be prepared for me to take 10 days to respond. Yeah, yeah. You know? and, and I love that. And by the way, that also, that's a great point you raised because somebody raised that the other day in another conversation is if you're a salesperson, right? If a customer or a prospect texts you and you immediately pick up the phone and call them, well, that may not be the best thing to do because they have texted you. And part of what they've just said is I like to communicate by text. Exactly. And what have you done? You've gone and phone called them. They didn't ask you to call them. So I absolutely, whether it's internal or whether it's, 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 you know, aligning yourself to how the person wants to communicate. And it's a sign of respect as well. Yeah. You know, I, I love the generational differences too. You know, I used to, uh, I, I used to call my kids on the phone and they would yeah. text me back. <laughs> And I would say, hey, last time I checked, uh, your tuition, room and board, food, that was all on me. So <laughs> text your friends when your dad calls, pick up. <laughs> if, if you want that to continue, you should pick up. So we established what the rules are, right? Like when mm -hmm. dad calls, pick up. In, in every other instance, let's, let's just text. So, you know, it's just awareness. And, and I get that sometimes people go, boy, that's a lot of work. And you say, you know, perhaps initially, yeah. Once you've got it down, though, what it does is it speeds up everything else. It speeds up communication, effectiveness, efficiencies, productivity. So it's it's like anything. It's like establishing your 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 CRM, right? All, loading all the data up at the front end is is a bear. Once it's there, wow. Exactly. You know, exactly. You know a good CRM, by the way. Do you know one that you might recommend? Yes, I would recommend Pipeliner CRM. <laughs> That's www.pipelinersales.com. <laughs> Take a free 14-day trial, uh, no obligation. Then you can check it out for yourself. Hey, um, um, thank you for that, Chester. And um, be <laughs> before we before we finish up, though, um, you have a new book coming out next year, I believe. We do. This is a, a, a really in, in advance. Uh, it's uh, leading with gratitude. Mm. Uh, it's a it's a wonderful combination. It's actually my co-author and I, Adrian Gostick. It's our eleventh book. We've had five New York Times bestsellers. We've sold over one point six million copies of our books in thirty languages. And again, it's the culmination of coming to back to what are the attributes of these great leaders. 
it was always their soft skills. And number one in those soft skills was gratitude. You think about the leaders that probably had the biggest impact on your career. And yes, they had tough conversations with you. And yet you knew that when you performed, they would give you credit, yeah. that yeah. they valued who you were. They were grateful for your sacrifice and service. And those are the leaders that we'll walk on hot coals for. Mm -hmm. So it was really interesting as we did that research. And we have, by the way, over a million uh, engagement surveys now, over 60,000 of these motivators assessments to draw from that database. So we talk about those eight ways, the eight best practices. And what I love, John, is at the end, we talk about take it home. Mm -hmm. You know, make sure that you don't leave these best practices in the workplace, that you take all this gratitude, you take all these best leadership principles and you apply them to the teams and the people that mean the most to you. So yeah. as we wrap up, I, I, I hope that what we've talked about does translate because my favorite data point is that when you're happy and engaged at work, when you're doing what you're passionate about at work, you're 150% more likely to be happy and passionate in your personal life. And isn't that what we're all looking for? Yeah, I, I, that's a perfect way to, to finish, Chance. I really appreciate it. Just before we go, if you just want to tell people a little bit more about yourself and where they can find out more about you. And by the way, I just wanted to put into context um, when Chester said the, the amount of books they have sold, most uh, business books they can, your publishers consider if you sell 3,000 copies that that's been a decent success. So <laughs> the 1.6 million or whatever copies you've sold your business books, just want to put that into context for our viewers. <laughs> I appreciate that because, you know, when we first published, we didn't know that. We thought if you didn't sell, you know, 10 million copies, yeah. you were a bum. <laughs> anyway, um, you can find us at the, thecultureworks.com. It's where you can, you know, investigate all the uh, training that we've got and our motivators assessment. I'd encourage you to follow me on LinkedIn. We're constantly putting up little videos and educational stuff and publishing. And of course, there's ChesterElton.com as well. So you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, thecultureworks.com and chesterelton.com. And thank you for letting me put that plug in, John. I yeah, absolutely. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.